Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap up of some of my recent reading. I'm going to start out by naming a couple of books that I can't actually talk about because they are for the Booktube prize, but you may have seen these pop up on my currently reading list if we're connected on Goodreads or Storygraph. The first book that I finished was Sonia Flerio's The Good Girls and Ordinary Killing, which is uh, basically investigative journalism looking into the very famous case from uh, 2014 where two girls, this you may have seen this on Twitter, where two young teenagers in northern India were found hanging from a tree and initially they said it was a rape and murder case and then it turned out to have maybe been a suicide or maybe been an honor killing. There were all kinds of controversies and this is digging into that. And I'm also nearly at the end, I have a couple of chapters left of Billie Jean King's memoir All In. She was a professional tennis player and also someone involved in a lot of sports businesses in the 60s and 70s and continuing onwards. And because it's a memoir, it's hard to talk about what I knew about her previously going into it without commenting on what I read, which is interesting. I should have done what Cousin from Always Doing does <laughs> and not have the group because then you can talk about it. Although I think with this group, if I talked about them, you would know <laughs> what they were. But in any case, Anyway, that's enough of the booktube prize books. So next up, I read another prison memoir. Then this is Jack Mapanji's And the Crocodiles Are Hungry at Night. I was reading this partially because I've been reading a lot of prison memoirs lately, but also because Mark from Book Time with Elvis was doing Reading Africa 2022, a tie-in to last year we did Reading Europe 2022, which is essentially a football picks your TBR game because the African Cup of Nations was happening Then I pulled Malawi and then as your team gets knocked out you're supposed to read something from the next country and uh, so on and so forth. Because this was so long I am behind on that. So Jack Mapanji was a poet and university professor when he was arrested under President Banda who was had one of those governments that uh, the US was sort of unofficially supporting just because they were theoretically Western facing, but it was very clearly a dictatorship and not a country experiencing a lot of freedom, but they weren't associated with uh, the Eastern Bloc and in the Cold War, people would turn their eyes away from things like that. And he wrote poetry that was published by the African Writers Series and that was kind of vaguely political. And as a result, he ended up being arrested. And one of the really interesting things about this is he spends most of the book or a good chunk of his imprisonment trying to wrestle with the fact that he has no idea what it was that he did that got him imprisoned. And unlike a lot of the prisoner memoirs where the people are aware of, well, they've been doing this kind of politically complicated thing. Yes, his, po his poetry was a little political, but it was so stealthily political that he, he spends a lot of time just saying, how on earth can this have happened? But at the same time, how did he miss that it was gonna be interpreted more politically? Which is really interesting. It's also interesting how he was basically able to get international help and have international attention to his case, even though the government was listening in on phone calls and pulling people's connections if they talked to people because he was friends with an Irish priest who called somebody in Ireland and spoke Irish and of course it's kind of like with the Navajo code talkers <laughs> if you speak a small enough language people don't figure that out I guess um, which is interesting so yeah maintain your small languages that have been oppressed by colonialism because you never know when you can get a secret message out is the moral of that story anyway if you are a fan of his poetry I definitely recommend picking this up if you are curious about things that were happening under at the end of President Banda of Malawi's rule um, there's that. I had read very little from Malawi before, either in terms of poetry or nonfiction, so that was really interesting. It sent me on lots of new things to research. So yeah, because there's some crazy stuff about that political family. It's wild. Really interesting stuff. Next up I read Yuri Androkhevich's The Moscoviad. I saw Cynthia from Book Whimsy talk about this, and she didn't particularly like it, but I could tell from the way she described it that this would absolutely be my kind of thing. This is a very short book and it is set just as the Soviet Union is crumbling at the end of the Cold War. And we are in the mind of this Ukrainian poet 
who is incredibly drunk all the time. And so we're never sure if he is having a kind of drunken hallucination or if the things that he's experiencing are actually happening. So he's stumbling through everything from bar fights to people, situations where he's in a food bank screaming poetry at people to <laughs> falling into pits in the earth and running into rat catchers and all kinds of craziness and all kinds of really bizarre and surreal stuff that could be true because it's that moment in the former Soviet Union where weird things were happening, but he is also incredibly drunk and possibly detoxing and who knows what's real. It is fantastic. Uh, I thought this was brilliant. He is, the main character is such an unpleasant person and it's just really entertaining to follow him on this fever dream of is it weird real stuff or is it just or is he hallucinating because he is has consumed so much vodka that he has fried his brain <laughs> it was uh really good but if you do not want to be in the mind of someone who may have let a man fall to his death and may have raped a woman and is in all kinds of situations that are at best gross yeah, you might not want to read that, but if you are up for it and you're really entertaining. <laughs> Did I say who translated this? This was translated from the Ukrainian by Vitaly Chernitsky, although I have read online that it's actually, that in the original it actually jumps back and forth between Russian and Ukrainian, so that is something that we lose in the translation, unfortunately. But still entertaining, um, if you like that kind of thing again. <laughs> After that, I read Crip Kinship, The Disability Justice and Arts Activism of Sins Invalid by Shida Kafe. And this book provides a fantastic overview of Sins Invalid, which is a disability justice themed performance project. And so in this book, she's both describing the history and also kind of examining the whole concept of storytelling as activism. Parts of this book are descriptions of some performances, and often they're ones that are already available on YouTube, which I was slightly disappointed about because I wanted to hear more about the ones that haven't been posted, but I'll link to the YouTube channel below if you're interested in that. And I think this book in particular is good if you're new to the project or if you've been following it and want to have an overview to flip through and enjoy that. The one issue that I have with this is that it is extremely jargon heavy. If you've read other books dealing with disability justice, you'll be familiar with a lot of the style of writing and the terminology that's used. And while there's definitely value to that because it's definitely challenging certain audiences to think about their expectations regarding things, I do think it makes certain things less accessible. And I think that is challenging in a project like this that is ideally aiming to break down barriers because it is putting in an extra barrier to entry. and. I mean, that's a hard thing to work with because how do you challenge the one audience and still make your work accessible to another? And that's kind of challenging, which actually leads into the one thing that I wish there was more of was there are a couple of points in here where they will mention, an intern mentioned that this wasn't particularly accessible to um, non-neurotypical people or a certain thing wasn't, or, or a certain piece of paperwork wasn't accessible to people with cognitive disabilities. Um, there was one thing where there was some gender dynamics at play and it's only mentioned at a surface level and I think for anybody else who's looking at this and looking to get into another cultural activism, performance as activism, storytelling as activism kind of project, I think it would have been useful to hear more about that just to know how to avoid it yourself. And the mentions are maybe to protect people from, uh, to let people save face I suppose, but I think for a broader community who might be looking to do a similar project, it would have been useful to know a little more. Either way, I think if you're interested in Sins Invalid or you're just generally interested in storytelling as activism or disability justice cultural projects, I think this is well worth picking up. Next up, I read a piece of fiction that is something that that is the first book in a series that I read books two and three of back when I was in high school. So we're talking more than 25 years ago, um, so it's been a while. The second book in the series is called The Kind Ghosts. The third one is The Wearing, the Wearing of the Green. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. This follows a pair of twins who are in England immediately prior to the First World War. They just turn 18. The sister becomes a nurse. The brother goes into the military. 
The typical things that you expect in a First World War story of this type happen. All their friends die, there's maybe an unhappy relationship in the making. It was entertaining enough to sit there and read this and I can definitely see why teenage me thought this was great fun. It is also the kind of book that I see people all the time say that there were no young adult books prior to either Harry Potter or Twilight. There definitely were, that's what stuff like this was. And I mean it suffers in part for that, it lacks a certain amount of depth in some parts where there's one point where the brother is complaining about his girlfriend and it, it's not great. But I mean it doesn't, I would say for something that was written like 32 years ago, it does not feel significantly different from the similar types of historical fiction you would read now, although um, I would guess that now some of the sex scenes would play out differently and the homoerotic relationship of the brother and one of his military friends would be played up slightly more, but yeah, I mean, it didn't age terribly. There are one or two lines that aren't great, but you know, I was entertained enough. <laughs> And it was a quick read. I sat down and, you know, plowed through it. It was great. Although I'm, I'm holding up something even shorter now. So I was going to talk about a cookbook that I read too, but maybe I'll make a separate video about that. Let me know if I should make a video about cookbooks that are entertaining to read, not just to use as um, sources of recipes. Maybe I'll do that. I'm not sure if I actually will, but we'll see. The last thing that I read here was a book in the Penguin Books Great Ideas series which was Ain't I a Woman. This looks like it would be a collection of Sojourner Truth's speeches, which is not exactly what it is because her speeches were not always written down immediately. So one of the points that's made in the introduction here is that because they only appear in parts and in articles by other people, there is a lot of question about what was actually in the original speech, especially because the most famous line that the title comes from was actually in something that was written several years later and the version of it that came out first uh, immediately after the speech didn't include that. Um, it also notes that a lot of her speeches were recorded in a southern dialect that she didn't actually speak, which means that the people writing the articles just went, well this is a former, <laughs> say a formerly enslaved person, I'm sure they didn't say it that way in those days, so they would just write it in this stereotyped dialect. So that was interesting knowing that and that they changed some of the famous bits into standard English, so that's interesting. That is about the first third. The final two thirds of this are a collection of articles and speeches by other activists, not necessarily of her generation because when she was speaking she was older. Some from formerly enslaved backgrounds, some from more middle class freeborn people of sometimes black American backgrounds, but some were Afro-Caribbean who so had moved to the US. And normally with these great ideas books I think they're too short and don't have enough context to them, although this does have an introduction, to, to really get anything across, but I quite liked that because one, it's very straightforward, you know what you're getting and it didn't need more context, but two, I think there is often commentary about, oh, people in the 1890s or the 1920s or the 1930s, when everybody talks about Gone with the Wind every six months on booktube. The articles that are in here are, were coming out in the 1870s, the 1880s. The speeches were coming out in that time, you know, people knew these things. Acting like people 60 years later were still ignorant of things, that, that is ridiculous. But um, yeah, so I think this is worth it just for people who push the idea that, oh, all of this stuff was unknown from 1865 until 1965. No, people knew this stuff. These things were published. Anyway, oh, the, the one really interesting thing about that is that in one of Sojourner Truth's speeches, she talks about expecting that women would have the vote within her lifetime, and she, this was the 1870s, and she thought that, and she was elderly at the time, so that's kind of depressing because she did not in fact live to see that but anyway there you go all right so this is the stuff that i've read lately if you've read any of these let me know what you think if you're reading stuff for the booktube prize which group did you get and if you didn't get a group but you signed up and you're getting them in the next one do you have any books that you're hoping that you're going to be asked to read i'll be curious to hear about that too all right that's it for now ciao